Hi, my name is Rebecca Murray. I'm an endocrine nurse practitioner based in Orlando, Florida. And I have the pleasure today of interviewing Dr. Dennis Goodman, who is the director of the Integrative Medicine Department at NYU Langone Medical Center. And also he is a clinical professor of medicine there and also clinical professor of medicine at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, which is wonderful, where he did his training. So getting right to the basics, what inspired you to become a doctor and a cardiologist in the first place? It's a good, great question. And uh, it's an easy one for me to answer because when I was a child, and I'm talking now from seven onwards, mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated by the human body. And I remember uh, from my bar mitzvah, when I was mm -hmm. 13 years old, as a mm -hmm. little, Jewish, little Jewish boy, I, was, I said, I want books on, on medicine. And I, at that time, realized that I had this fascination with the complexity of mm -hmm. the human body. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to try to find out as much as I could about it. And it was also linked with this feeling that I really wanted to help people. And one of the privileges we have working as doctors, nurses, anybody in the healthcare field, we have an opportunity every single day to make a difference mm -hmm. in people's lives. And I think you'd agree with me, mm -hmm. nothing makes you happier. I always tell people, if you're looking for happiness, one of the things you mm -hmm. should do is make somebody else happy because that's when you feel so good. And so, although it's hard and it's very stressful, we have this opportunity. So that combination of being able to learn about the human body and to be able to help people put me on that journey. And I found it really helpful to have this goal early on in life, mm -hmm. because one of the issues for kids today is they're not sure what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And when you've got a goal, and you know you have to work hard towards it, it's much easier to sit down. It doesn't come naturally to anybody. You have to work hard to do well at school so that mm -hmm. you can go to a great university, so you can get into a medical school, so that you can get into a residency and fellowship and on and on. So I knew early on that I have to really apply myself and I'll end up being at one of the greatest medical schools, certainly uh, mm -hmm. in South Africa and in the mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And that's where I trained. Excellent. As I mentioned, you're the chairperson of the Integrative Medicine Department. Now, most physicians and cardiologists that are trained in the traditional educational format do not integrate the functional medicine approach. So what led you in that direction? So that's also an easy thing for me to answer because I realized early on as well that I actually became an interventional cardiologist. So you can imagine I was actually taking care of people running to the emergency room, uh, people having heart attacks, mm -hmm. take someone to the cath lab in the middle of the night, you'd have to put a stent in. And, excuse me, sometimes you were so fortunate to save somebody's life. And sometimes, no matter what you did, they weren't going to survive. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a fireman running to a house mm -hmm. on fire. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was just too late no matter what you did. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize that the one way that you can, that I personally, and most of us can really make a, <clears throat> make a difference, try to prevent, prevent terrible things from happening. And mm -hmm. there's a saying that people have, what's the best way to treat a heart attack or a stroke, mm -hmm. and that's to prevent it. So I decided to get into the whole field of prevention. And I think I'm one of the few cardiologists who board certified in interventional cardiology and integrative holistic medicine, and I'm very proud of it. And I would agree. I had, uh, you know, about two years at the Scripps Institute mm -hmm. uh, of Integrative Medicine with Mimi Guarneri as the chief there, and it was inspiring to me, and I was able to really get a feel for what it's about, and I'm now very focused on trying to be a bridge between traditional and integrative medicine. And that's why it's such a joy to be here mm -hmm. at this conference because there are many of us here, you know, where you feel you're talking to people who feel the same way. That we're looking for evidence-based medicine on both sides. And it's so important to have a conversation mm -hmm. so that we all 
learning from each other and we can offer the patients uh, the best possible outcomes. And it's very obvious we don't have all the answers mm -hmm. in traditional allopathic mm -hmm. medicine and we don't have them in non-traditional medicine either. Um, but together we can mm -hmm. often really help a patient because I tr truly believe that first let's be conservative, let's use natural approaches, let's do things that we can't hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be a terrible side effect or a complication from a procedure. That's where you go when there's no more options. So I felt that I really wanted to learn about natural ways mm -hmm. to help people and that's where functional medicine sits. Not waiting for a disease to happen but trying very, very hard to find out what's going on and how can you prevent it before a person becomes symptomatic with a disease. And in terms of cardiology, um, and I'm a cardiologist and that's mm -hmm. obviously a passion of mine, there's this well-known fact that almost half of the heart attacks where people die, it's their first and last symptom mm -hmm. of heart disease. And so, Rebecca, what that tells you is we have to do a better job mm -hmm. of making people aware of when they're at risk and doing something about it so the first and last symptom isn't mm -hmm. a heart attack. Can you think of a particular case that stands out in your mind where you can uh, There's this? so many wonderful cases that I've had and you know, there's one that does jump to mind and it's related to, um, I was a cardiologist in San Diego, I was actually the chief of cardiology at Scripps Memorial for many years there. And I had a very good friend who was a pulmonologist and one day he came to me and said, Dennis, I'm having such a terrible time with my dad who lives in Seattle. He's getting more and more depressed. He's having funny chest pains and palpitations. He's seen the doctors. He's had the tests and they're all telling him there's nothing wrong with him um, and that he's fine. And he's just getting more and more depressed and please will I see him. And I remember saying, you know, of course I'm happy to see him but to have him come down here Mm -hmm. um, the chances of me finding something <laughs> that they haven't. He mm -hmm. was at very reputable institutions there. Mm -hmm. I'd seen may, and doctors that I, even, I knew who they were and they were excellent. Uh, but he came and, and the amazing thing is I'll never forget the day that I walked into my waiting room to meet him because I saw him on the schedule. There were about 15 people in the room and I said well come back and they all got up to come back because it was his family. He was from an Italian family the children came, some of the grandchildren came, and he was like the godfather. Mm -hmm. And you can see how much they all loved him. And uh, I reviewed the records and I spoke to him. And when I looked at the records, there wasn't any evidence of structural heart disease. He was having palpitations, he had a few PVCs, but there was nothing going mm -hmm. on structurally that could explain his symptoms. And I remember saying, are you upset about something? Are you depressed about something? And he said, no. But when I was in the office at the end talking about what this could be, I told his family in front of him that when I see this situation and people are having ongoing symptoms and there's no evidence of a structural problem, I always think about some kind of stress, some psychological reason mm -hmm. that this could be happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it, in a second, his, his daughter jumped up and she said, Dr. Gooden, please can I speak to you outside? And she took me out of my office and she said, I want you to know that he is not talking to my brother, his son. They had a fight six months ago and mm -hmm. my, my brother's gone to Vegas. They don't talk to each other and it's killing him. And I, mm -hmm. um, I said, you know, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I came back in the, into the office and I said, I think we've got the answer. Mm -hmm. I think you've got a broken heart syndrome. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, the treatment for this is not medication. And I said, you have to go and see your son and you have to go talk to him and I told him that they should go straight from San Diego to right. go and see the son and I said if he refuses to see him I will call him and tell mm -hmm. him that if you want to see your father again alive mm -hmm. you should talk to him and um, so fast forward two weeks uh, one day I open the, again I'm in my office someone knocks on the door and somebody walks in with this case of beautiful wine from the Napa Valley. But that wasn't what really got me excited. It was the note inside. Mm, and there was a note from him in his writing. And he said, Dr. Goodman, thank you for saving my life. Mm. I've got 
no more pain, and I am back with my son. You know, I'm so grateful. And it's a powerful story mm -hmm. because it made me realize something that I really live by and, and that I truly believe. People have got underlying issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems, we don't get a chance to find out. And so one of the things that I try, and we all do, you know, that live mm -hmm. in the space of mm -hmm. integrative functional medicine, and certainly I'd say a lot of excellent doctors will stop and say, okay, we don't have a, we don't have a structural problem, but who is your headache? Mm -hmm. And who is your chest pain? And I've said that many times to patients, and especially women, mm -hmm. they sometimes just burst out crying. Mm -hmm. And so stress, Rebecca, is a major mm -hmm. cause of symptoms. And it's hard for people to come to a doctor and say, I'm stressed. But they will come with a symptom. Mm -hmm. I've got a headache, I've got a stomach ache, I've got a chest pain, I'm having palpitations. So there are numerous stories, and mm -hmm. my greatest pleasure is being able to sift out who has a symptom related to a stressful situation and help them fix it without okay. tests and mm -hmm. procedures, unnecessary medications. Sounds like you're getting to the heart of the matter. Getting to the heart of the matter. It's, it's that feeling of you know, trying to fix a broken heart. And I think that was one of the reasons I became a cardiologist because we have this incredible opportunity of fixing a heart that's, got, that's structurally broken is mm -hmm. an organic mm -hmm. uh, problem and then helping a heart to heal mm -hmm. where there's mm -hmm. a psychological problem. There actually is a condition called Takasuba's uh, cardiomyopathy where they actually, yes. under stressful situations, particularly women, we think it's probably spasm, they can actually have a heart attack mm -hmm. without any blockage inside the coronary artery. In other words, something happens, the stress is so mm -hmm. great and they can just blow out part of their left ventricle. Um, and thank goodness most of them recover, but it's an example of severe mm -hmm. stress mm -hmm. causing, in this situation, a real structural problem. Now, at this conference, you are actually speaking on new insights into genetics, so how are you incorporating that? What, what, what right. brought you in the direction right. of looking right. at genetics? So, part of the reason I'm doing this is I'm constantly, like you, we know each other very mm -hmm. well, trying to learn new things, trying to stay on what's current. And one of the most important things for all of us as doctors is to try to sort out who's at risk mm -hmm. from certain conditions so that we can treat them early, that we can be aggressive. And we're now finding out that genetics, which we've known all along is very, very important and powerful, we now have a way to personalized medicine, which is what we really want to do. What is specifically is good for you? And what are your specific risk factors? And we now be able to dig deep, to get below mm -hmm. the surface. Uh, I always think of like, you know, when you think of an iceberg above the water, mm -hmm. you're only seeing what's on top of the water, but there's a huge iceberg underneath. And looking into the genes and being able to go below the surface and trying to find out what are the things that put you at risk? Where mm -hmm. is your genetic Mm -hmm. your genetic uh, makeup. And what I want to be very, very clear about and emphasize on something that I've read and learned, which is very clear, and it's the field of epigenetics. You may be born with a certain gene that's abnormal, mm -hmm. but whether it expresses itself mm -hmm. is up to you. So that's a huge thing for us all to know. Your genes are not your destiny. You can express your genes both the good ones and the bad ones, depending on your behavior. And there is a lot of data. There's a great article from 2016 in the New England Journal where they took groups of people with high risk based on their genes. Mm -hmm. They gave them healthy lifestyle, and they had to lose weight, no smoking, exercise, eat healthy. There was a close to 50% reduction right. in cardiac events in the group that made these lifestyle changes. So preventative medicine, I think starts with having knowledge, mm -hmm. knowledge is power, and then using this knowledge to live your life in a healthy way. And that's a huge challenge, we all are challenged by that, mm -hmm. but that's part of our challenge as doctors, motivating people to be healthy and to do the things that are going to keep them healthy and live long, good quality lives, no matter what their genes. 
So a part of functional medicine, obviously, is the appropriate nutrients. And I know we've written a number of books on different supplements. So I'd like to end this interview by asking you, what is your favorite supplement? You're right. And as, t as part of my journey, I, I, I realized that I have to learn and understand mm -hmm. what are the supplements and why do so many mm -hmm. people take supplements. Um, there was actually a study at one of the American College of Cardiology meetings where they asked doctors, do you prescribe, uh, do, uh, there was a question, do you prescribe supplements? And, you know, most of them said no. You know, 5% said yes. But when they said, do you take them? 60% said yes. <laughs> so there is clearly an indication in my mind for mm -hmm. supplements. The best thing you can always do is eat a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. four to six servings of healthy fruits and vegetables. But a lot of times you're still not getting sufficient nutrients. And my favorite one is magnesium. And I have written a book about magnesium because the body does not make magnesium mm -hmm. and we need magnesium. It's a very, very critical cofactor for conversion of ADP to ATP. So that's my favorite and mm -hmm. it's very, very important. And of course there are many others like vitamin D, but that's the right. answer to your question. That is great. And on behalf of AMG, Thank you for coming and presenting it's this year. It's a pleasure to be here and I'm delighted to be invited. Thank you again. Thanks for interviewing me. Mm -hmm.